Thank you for calling Death Before Desk Job. If you are this week's guest, please leave a message and Paul will call you back once he finishes the intro. Yo, Paul, it's Ono. Thought we were supposed to talk today. Get me back. Hi, this is Paul, and you're listening to Death Before Desk Job, the podcast geared towards creative people who are pursuing or who want to be pursuing their creative endeavors to their heart's content. Today, I have a friend with me. Uh, He's one of those artists that just makes my head spin. Uh, The output this guy has blows my mind. He seems to hit this amazing balance where anyone can see how much work it took to create what he created, but there's this air of effortlessness to it. He's an outstanding musician. He's a gifted visual artist. Rene Molina, more widely known by his moniker Onodera, is my guest today. I'm excited to talk to him, but before I get to that, I feel like it's important to address the microscopic elephants in the room. The COVID-19 pandemic is affecting everybody in different ways, and because the show is about creatives, I do want to address how this affects freelancers and self-employed people. Uh, According to a survey that was put together by the Freelancers Union, over 75% of surveyed freelancers have had contracts canceled because of the coronavirus. Nearly two-thirds of them are having a very difficult time finding new ones. Only one out of 20 of the surveyed freelancers have had no impact on their work at the time of the survey. And if you were to ask me, I don't know how long that's going to hold out for them. There is no way around it. It's pretty bleak. But thankfully, there has been a lot of legislation uh, coming forward to help protect us. And while there could always be more, it's important to take advantage of what's right in front of us now. So I'm just going to let you all know what options you do have, as far as I can see. If you have more information than I do, please share it with me at deathbeforedeskjob at gmail.com. Send it to me and I will try to work it in on social media or the next episode, if applicable. I know that at least in New York State, where I am, freelancers and self-employed people can apply for unemployment for the first time and be able to receive up to $600 a week. The process is an ordeal. I can say that I've experienced it firsthand. It is a challenge. Be patient. Ride the process out. Check with your state. Uh, Go and search for self-employed unemployment or COVID-19 freelancer help. I'm sure you'll find what you need for your state. Uh, Another thing to consider is a PPP loan. These are government-issued loans that can be forgiven under the right criteria and if the guidelines are followed. It's very rare the government is just throwing 5000 bucks at small businesses. So if you are interested in looking into this, you should definitely investigate to see if you are eligible. All you need to do is search for PPP loan information. I got information through my bank. There was a little notification on the top of the bank's homepage, and I could click that, and it led me to more information about it. Government assistance aside, get creative. Perhaps there's a need you can fill as a maker. Uh, Maybe You can get involved with the process of crafting something that's in short supply right now. I've seen Etsy sellers drop their ordinary craft and switch over to making masks to provide for the people that don't have them. But if you're not a crafter of that nature, a musician, a painter, what have you, maybe you can do something else to help raise money for relief efforts. And when I say that, I must insist you be sincere. Under no circumstances should you exploit the kindness of others. I've seen it. It's vile. I can't believe I need to say be good to people. And I sincerely hope the people listening here are the kind of people that don't need that kind of reminder. But maybe you know some people that need that reminder. Drag them out in the street and let them know that you know. If you're doing okay and uh, you want to help in a small way, maybe you don't have unlimited time and resources, maybe you're just run down and exhausted by this whole entire predicament, like I am, and you want some semblance of normalcy, you can try to support your local artist community from home. Uh, You can try to support the people 
that you know whose businesses might be struggling right now. Those of you who know me know that I've been working with a company called Dayani Yoga for over two years now. I'm not a yogi. I am the artwork guy. I'm the behind the scenes guy. Uh, frankly, I'm sedentary. I don't take yoga classes. Right now, I have no excuse. I have uh, a need to engage in some sort of physical activity because I'm going crazy in the house. They are offering classes from a virtual studio of sorts through Zoom. And if you are interested in taking yoga classes, you can always check out their website, Dayani Yoga. That's D-A-A-Y-A-N-I yoga.com. You can see what they have as far as online classes and memberships, things like that. I want to praise their resilience. I think resilience should be rewarded. So if you are looking for some cool ways to have some normalcy and peace in your life in an otherwise chaotic and turbulent time, I'm going to point you their way. If you want to alert me to how your enterprise is adapting or how you're coping, uh, let me know and I'll try to put the word out there for you. Most importantly, though, take care of yourself. You're going through something catastrophic right now, okay? I understand that things could be worse. I'm on Long Island. There are no bombs falling from the sky. Nobody is being called to arms. And some people want to remind you that. They want to tell you that all you're being asked to do is sit around and watch Netflix and just suck it up. I acknowledge the sentiment. Be grateful it's not worse. I am constantly thinking about how much worse it could be, but that's not to say this is not a challenge. Human beings are, by their very nature, social creatures being asked to change our lives on, on a dime because of something we have no control over. And we're forced to face facts that a virus doesn't discriminate. Any of us can be affected by it. And so a lot of people, myself included, are experiencing uh, an existential crisis. It's scary to think of your own mortality, and even though we're not thinking of it on a conscious level every day because we'd go crazy, we're thinking about it in the back of our heads. This fear is causing people to get sad and feel depressed, and it may cause us to be short with the people we love. And if you are scared, I want you to know that this too shall pass. If you've lost somebody close to you, or fallen ill yourself to the coronavirus, my heart goes out to you because nobody deserved this. Nobody asked for this. It's not fair, and I don't want to see anyone suffer. I wish I had the answers as to when this all would end, but all I can do is assure you that if you're down on yourself because you are not as productive as you are normally, or you're not making as much money, or you suddenly feel sad for no reason, and you can't understand why, don't worry. I understand why. It's normal. It's the most normal response to the most unusual set of circumstances that many of us have ever lived through. So please don't beat yourself up over the fact that you're struggling right now. Take a deep breath. Take care of yourself first. We need to get through this. And the harder you are on yourself during this whole thing, the less likely you are to come out in one piece. And when the world gets back to normal... The world is going to need you in it. If I hear of any news that is relevant, I'm going to try to post it on Instagram. I'll share links if I can. If you have questions or concerns, or if you want to voice your feelings about this whole thing, please send me an email, and maybe I'll read them um, on the podcast. But speaking of fan mail of sorts, there is one last thing I want to say. I do want to read a text that I got from a friend of mine. I was having a really rough time, as we all are, and uh, I got this text the day after releasing the first episode. It helped me out of a funk of sorts, so I'm just going to share this thought uh, real quick. Excellent job on the podcast, man. Everything from the name to your voice is aces. Oh, thanks, dude. You have a knack for interviewing. As a person who is currently struggling with making the very decisions you are talking about, this really hits home. I feel as if you were speaking directly to me. Right now I am in the process of deciding to go back to school or take a job. That made me think that the term desk can really signify anything someone is hesitant towards doing. Yes, you get it. Uh, a desk is also a solitary place where one can do many things. Either watch the world go by 
or reflect and make a decision. Wow. I'm proud of you, bud. I will continue to listen and yield your advice. Uh, please always take my advice with a grain of salt. But uh, thank you so much for the motivation. Uh, with that said, here's my interview with the incredibly talented Ono Dara. Sonic pain. It could all be so simple. Them kicks causing ripples in my mental. Slow drip. Empty click, 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 click from an empty pistol. I've learned what's good for art. Ain't always good for what's fiscal. I'm official. I've been living simple. Been pressing up so, Renee, how's it going, man? It's going well going well i'm all quarantined out you know ready for the evening quarantined out meaning you're you're locking down not that you're sick right oh no not at all it means okay. i have uh i bought a sufficient amount of alcohol to last me the weekend i did not buy enough alcohol to last the weekend man it, you know it's rough i was trying to hit up a liquor store and uh it was it was a toss-up admittedly but yeah. you know as you would expect there uh the carvel is essential but the wine and liquors by me is apparently not essential, which I don't know how that math works out. But, you know, talk to New York State, I guess, right? Yeah, most. I mean, it, I mean, the city, it was considered essential. But I know, um, I don't know. I, there is like some service now that you can use. I think it's called Drizzly or something. And you can get alcohol delivered, but who knows what they charge. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'm cool with the 7-Eleven White Claws if that's going to be the, <laughs> the oh, whole process. Hell yeah. You know? Yeah, most definitely. Um, so, you know, it, it's interesting because I had my last interview I did with uh Carbone from Moontooth and mm -hmm. it's it's different talking to you because with him I've got almost 20 years to go on and I can kind of pull from all these little pieces uh and when it comes right. to you I've known you for a couple of years you were sort of in my uh peripheral for a while in the beginning and I think the first time I ever saw you uh performing or creating th anything it must have been probably about like 2015 and you were it was you were doing a backyard show somewhere uh, and you were playing an acoustic guitar and i remember that and um all this time has gone by and i've seen you like you clearly run a gamut you you're you're doing um these amazingly masterful like lo-fi hip-hop albums with blending of genres and you are an accomplished player uh, at your instrument and and to boot, you are a visual artist, uh, and I have no qualm saying you are one of the visual artists that makes me nervous. You know, you you uh, <laughs> you give me a run for my money, and you you uh, you push me because you are so talented. And if I didn't believe that there was room in the world for everybody, I would be nervous. But you know, I, I just wanted to say from the start, I I admire everything you do, but there's so much I don't know. And so I kind of want to start digging around uh, before I talk too much. Um, where does the drive to to be constantly producing come from for you? Um, well, first off, I do want to say that's kind of a funny way to look at the artist to artist relationship, because that's like a really hip hop sort of thing, you know, like, oh, this rapper, he makes me nervous. But I don't it's funny, like, I don't think of that in terms of like visual artists. You know, so it's interesting to hear another artist kind of take that perspective uh, from a visual art perspective. Um, but where do I find the drive? Um, I don't know, man. Just it's just a search for purpose. You know, it, like if I'm not creating something, I my day is so much longer. The week is longer, uh, you know, and the, the sun is less bright, you know, just existentialism, man. I just I have to do something, leave some sort of mark do something that I know only I can produce in a way that I can produce it. That can't just be like anyone can scan an item across the cash register, you know? Um, but only, only I can make my art, my music and my sound and my visuals the way that I can do them. So yeah, I, I think it's just that it's kind of a cheesy answer, but you know, that search for identity. Uh, when did that search for identity start for you? Do you remember when you kind of started feeling that itch for the first time? You know, I've been drawing, probably since like the first grade. I don't think I, I think it's always been there, but I don't think I, I always understood it as I do now. Cause uh, looking back, I think it's always been that kind of search for a concrete identity outside of like this like physical form, you know, this, uh, th th this sack of meat that I carry around every day. But, you know, I think it's always been there. I didn't always know it as such, like I said, but you know, since, since I began drawing in first grade, it, it's just, 
that desire for some sort of permanence outside of myself. I can relate to the the need to kind of carve a, you know, to, to prove your worth to yourself in some strange way uh i don't know yeah. if that's that's the way to put it um no that's a good way that's a good way you know yeah it it, it you know, i i have to say that with like the asterisk of like we obviously all have value but you know yeah there is this sort of weird thing that you experience where you kind of just you need to do something because what the hell else is there to do it's that dread baby it's it's a great fuel man uh this this <laughs> car runs on it yeah <laughs> absolutely man absolutely um but uh, with that said, so you you've been at this since since then you and and you've been making since then. Um, and as I mentioned, you seem to open all these different doors. Do you have in your mind in your book so far? Do you have it in chapters where it's like, okay, well, this is where I was drawing, and this is where I got to guitar, and this is where I got into producing. And are there partitions in between the two? Or are they were they all sort of simultaneously? Um, moving roads that kind of crossed over each other um in my mind uh the only continuous road was really the illustration because my first love before music was comic books and comic books and anime you know just drawing dragon ball z and pokemon or whatever the hell was inspired me at that moment the other parts like uh, playing guitar and singing songwriting and rapping and producing those are definitely kind of, like in my mind there are like these little flags of of when they started like this was 16 this is maybe at 20 or so um but since that flag has kind of been placed the way it works now is i just kind of go through phases like the last month and a half all i wanted to do was make music and uh i'm, I'm the type of person that just kind of follows the inspiration because you know you can't summon that on a whim it, it has to present itself to you so you know I, I try to ride that little wave of creativity as far as it'll take me so these past months uh, maybe like a month and a half, I've just been solely focused on music. And now the wave is kind of shifting towards all this watercolor painting. Um, so so to sum it up, yeah, like, yeah, besides uh, the drawing, which has been consistent my whole life, there are like specific points where I began that other journey in uh, these other mediums. And as they exist currently, the, uh, I just go through waves. I mean, I've even, since the quarantine started, I've been picking up my guitar a lot. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if I did some acoustic shows uh, later on down the year. I know I'd welcome it just because I'd be happy to see you in person or anyone in person for that matter. But, you know, like, I, <laughs> I, yeah, like that would be very interesting, a full circle thing for me, at least, because that's that's one of the first times I ever saw you. And I saw you doing that. And then to see all the other things you've done and see you circle back to that, that's that would be super cool. Um, if you do that, I will be there. Um sure you're talking about following the inspiration though and you follow the wave is it is there i'm not going to say is there a rule because i know there's no rule but for you is there a way that inspiration tends to present itself most frequently is it a certain set of parameters and circumstances that you put yourself in to receive that inspiration or is it absolute chaos at any moment almost like a, it comes on like a seizure I don't know. It's kind of a little bit of column A, column B. You know, I, everything's chaos. Everything's entropy. But um, with that in mind, chaos, it can't be controlled, but it can be guided, you know. So um, typically, like, the way that that wave starts is uh, honestly me forcing myself into that role of the creative. Like, sometimes I don't, I mean, I'd say most times, I don't really feel like drawing. I don't really feel like making a beat. I don't really feel like writing something new. But, you know, it's like I was saying before, that itch of scratching something more permanent than myself into this, uh, you know, this, this snow globe of a world we have here, um, it kind of takes over me. So I force myself to uh, start that journey of creativity. And by the, by, by the time the night's over, I've made a whole new song. It's, it's really interesting to me to hear you say something to the effect of, and, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it's like, oh, there's the call for inspiration, but I really don't want to answer it right now, but I'm, I'm gonna, because you're kind of making me. That's sort I, I of... I don't know if it's a... I don't even recognize the call for inspiration. It, it, it's a really complicated answer. The, the, the more I think about it, because I'm kind of making these up on the fly, like asking myself the question, I think I could more appropriately define it as like, my, my ears aren't right from the start in tune to that call you know mm -hmm. um so i have to sit down and put myself in a mode b through sheer uh, power of will and discipline like i'll I, sometimes i have to sketch an hour and a half before i realize what i want to paint 
You know, sometimes mm -hmm. I, I have to listen to the same beat on, on, on a loop and add my own drums and maybe throw a synth in before I know what I want to write. But uh, before my my um, my pen can, can hear that call of inspiration, I have to, you know, put myself in that mode. So I, I'd say it's more akin to me having to put my ears in tune to that call. Mm -hmm. It's a it, forgive the terrible metaphor I'm about to use, uh, but it sounds like your uh, your pen is the antenna and it only works when it's facing upright. Like, you know, it's okay. Okay, I, yeah, yeah. like where I'll you got to be you got to be in the position and you have to be actively doing in order to receive signal. Like everything's got to be set up. Yeah. I, I look at art, uh, as I've grown, I, I look at it like working out, you know, I, I man, I don't want to work out. It sucks sometimes, man. Uh, sometimes, but, but life is mostly doing shit. You don't want to do because you know, you should be doing it, you know? So, um, I, I really look at artwork as a discipline. I look at songwriting and, and making beats and doing anything creative as a discipline. When I was a kid, I, I kind of looked at it as an escape. But, you know, the, the, the older I get, the more I kind of respect it as this thing that, that should be practiced, not just this thing I clumsily fall into, you know. it's uh, For me, it's about building good habits. I would agree with that. And it's very interesting that you draw that distinction and you say it is a discipline as opposed to an escape because, yes, it can be those things um, it starts off like that sure you know? it starts off as that escape but you know if those people who only look at it as that escape uh, i notice at least they kind of tend to fall off as the years progress and, and they say things like oh i used to draw i used to write songs so um i'm just trying to find a perspective that will allow me to take this as far as as far as i can take it and and uh this whole idea of almost like it's a martial art that whole idea of discipline has really made me respect it more and forced me to give it the time I would give to other things. I'm glad that you give the respect that you do to it because it shows. And uh, thanks, man. there is uh, an interesting thought, like, you know, you brought up literally martial arts, which would bring me into influences. But before I even go there, um, I, I did want to make a note that when you're talking about people who view it as an escape, those people also, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and generalize about the the uh, the people who might uh, give you some resistance or try to discourage you from pursuing the arts because in my experience those people who might give you resistance I think when they see somebody who is actively uh, creating and treating it uh, as a discipline like you do they may be seeing it as you just being escapist and not uh, taking on real life when in reality you are practicing your discipline and and creating because this is your life and you want it to be your life i i always lead with i don't know anything so i would certainly give that credence you know this is just a uh, that that could totally be true you know um i think that's totally valid i don't know maybe uh there's some facet of this i'm, I'm not ready to to fully appreciate so i'm i'm open to being wrong um but my creation, as I understand it, uh, it, it's really not about escape as a method. Well, maybe it is. I don't even know. I never really thought about that. You just kind of put a whole new perspective in there. <laughs> oh, I, I wasn't trying to tell you you were wrong, by the way. I was trying to tell oh, no, you not, that. Yeah, uh, I didn't get that feeling, but okay, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Just wanted to make sure. Because, like, yeah, I do think you're right that this is a discipline. And this is, seems to be a theme when I talk to creative people. It seems to be that, like, there are these people who try to tell you, why don't you get a get a real job this isn't you know they, and they look at it as like you're trying to just you know lollygag and uh, you're not taking things seriously and then i see somebody like you who who treats this as seriously as a bodybuilder would treat working out like you said which is like a, an amazing metaphor and 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 your dedication to that shows um so i did want to bring up your influences you brought up martial arts which uh you know your visual art uh, definitely does have those connections to you know the things you mentioned like comic books and anime and uh, presently as it stands I know that uh, there's a lot of influence from uh, uh, the Japanese culture that's made its way into your artwork whether it be you know current um, you know things like manga and whatnot or artwork from hundreds of years ago the the uh, illustrations and paintings of shoguns and things like that mm -hmm. was there like a a moment you stumbled into that and, and fell in love with it and 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 made that a part of your 
uh, process in some way or uh, has it just always kind of been there for you? Well, identifying my inspirations is, uh, I don't know. It's another thing I, I really try and approach all this artistry with like as little thought as possible because uh, I, uh, the moment I start thinking too hard about something, I notice that I kind of fall off from it. So I don't know. I don't, I, it's it's, it's kind of like just tuning my ear to that that inspiration you know i don't really know where it is or where it comes from until it's there like the other day i was watching blade runner and man i've been on a ridley scott kick ever since i've always kind of been on this like subconscious ridley scott and that's been like one of the biggest inspirations you know um when it becomes an inspiration it, it just is that like there are rappers that i've been listening to for years that i would never say inspired me Mm-hmm. Um, yet I love their music, you know, and, and, and I consume it at, at a great volume. Then there are other rappers um, that I hear a song they just released. And before I even finish that song, that verse, my mind is already like, damn, I want to rap right now. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. There, there are artists like uh, Mike Mignola who, who does Hellboy. Like he does that for me visually. Um, I'll look at his artwork and before I even finish this comic book or, or really examine this painting that he's done, I'm like, damn, I want to go sit down and draw something right now versus other artists um, that I see their work and I'm like, it doesn't make me want to draw, even though I, I absolutely love it. So um, inspiration is a, is a funny thing for me. It, it, it's strange. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm super underthought with everything. So I don't really know. That's a tough question. <laughs> That's okay. You know, frankly, I don't ever expect anybody to have a, a right answer for it. And, uh, you know, yeah, that yeah. Th- that kind of answer can change. It, it's Absolutely. just, you know, I guess if I have any real objective here, it's really just to kind of like root around and see what comes up in these interviews. And uh, mm-hmm. I'm just sort of like, all right, well, if there's something there and you're like, I can point to this moment cool and if it's if it's a matter of i just have to be ready for the moment and i don't know that is also totally valid because Mm -hmm. that may resonate with somebody more than you giving a direct um line of influence so if if thinking about it too much makes you back away from it don't think about it too much keep doing what you're doing i'm not here to break your process by any means i'm just definitely not (laughs) um so uh yeah i i did want to talk about um a a process a little bit not only in terms of like how you go about creating things um but also in terms of like it sounds to me like your process in making art or making music they they seem um at their core fundamentally similar in the sense that you just put yourself there and just kind of work your way through it until that moment happens and then you follow it could you maybe express any differences in that process between uh, the visual arts and, and music? Have you noticed any weird parallels and have you noticed any things that are totally different that your process has to change completely for it? Um, No, I think you pretty much uh, hit the nail on the head. Everything I I do in life is kind of a, um, it's really (laughs) haphazard i don't i don't do anything right the first time or the first 50 times i i kind of just run into a wall until that motherfucker breaks you know (laughs) um between drawing between painting between making uh music um making beats recording my own audio you know it's really just carving marble sculptures with a a rusty spoon until that shit looks okay and then (laughs) you know i move on to the next sculpture and every time i get it i finesse it a little bit so it is about as haphazard as, as you've described. Um, I'm, I'm a real big believer in uh, it's not about like the materials that you have. It's, it's about what you do with them, whether you have like a $5 pack of Crayola markers um, or you have, you know, a $150 pack of Prismas or you have a $20 mic or you have a $120 mic with uh, respectable recording equipment. It's, it's about making that, uh, that material work for you and for you to for you to figure out what works for you you, you have to figure out um, what you looks like what you sounds like and that in and of itself is a, is a process that is far bigger than anything a material uh, could possibly offer you so it is it, it is real kind of chaotic 
but the more I get to know my materials, uh, be it the paints or be it the, um, the instruments and the recording equipment and the programs that I use, the more I get to know it, the, the more comfortable I feel um, being in that element and honestly just experimenting with it. That's, that's totally fair. Um, I can speak to that point myself. I'm trying to stitch this podcast together and I'm not a producer. And uh, I'm trying to make it work the way I know how. And I'm sure if I showed this to some of my producer friends, they'd look at me like I had eight heads. And it's like, how are you capturing the audio? Like, what is the bit rate? And I'd stare at them blankly, you know, because I don't really understand it. I'm just trying to do something. Or I still don't understand anything about bit rate as much like audio as I, I actually worked on some podcasts, doing some audio for some homies and myself when I had a small podcast before. Um, and I don't know nothing about audio. So as much audio as, as I export and send to people for, and as high quality as they tell me it is, I don't know anything. <laughs> you're, you're taking um, swings, man. You're just taking swings and yeah, doing what sounds man. good. Sometimes, you know, a broken clock is right twice a day. <laughs> but on that note, you, you specifically brought up things about like how it doesn't matter what tools they are. It matters like what you do with them. And um, mm-hmm. you were talking about, you know, hitting things till the, the wall breaks. I feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, I remember once tuning into one of your Twitch streams, you were drawing on um, and, and, and just filming the whole process and you were answering some questions from people as they were like tuning in. And um, I feel like at that point you would even mention that you were using the specific pen and that you may have mentioned that you weren't even using it the way that it was supposed to be used. Oh yeah. So I guess my question for you is to kind of like point to be up. So that way there's something that somebody can point to and say, this guy has doing this wrong and it's working great for him. Is there something that you know that you're doing wrong that is making things right for you um, and defining your style? Is there something you could point to? Oh man, multiple across multiple mediums comes to mind. I think I know what you're talking about because I had just started, uh, first off, Twitch streaming is a whole nother lane of me running into this uh, metaphorical brick wall until I figure out how to break it by brute force. And I'm still trying to run into that wall. So I'll be back on that eventually once I get reliable internet connection. Yeah. But I think what I was doing, uh, do you know what uh, water, uh, water brushes are? It's like those plastic brushes that you fill up the tank with water. I saw you using one at a coffee shop once. That's the only time I've ever seen one. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, – I'm not sure if other people do this. This is just kind of something that I I, I figured would make sense in, in my little dumb pea brain, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and what I started doing at, the, at that time, uh, I bought a bunch of them, and I filled – each one up with varying amounts of ink versus water. So instead of like a a pitch black line, uh, like as if you filled it up with pure ink, I filled it up with like maybe 10% ink and 90% water. And maybe the next one would be like 30% ink and 70% water. So I would would essentially make my own uh, gray toned brush pens so I could like ease into like that full, you know, contrast black, you know. Um, and, and, and that's one, one thing that comes to mind. Uh, like, I don't think these pens are intended to be used like that, but I figure like, fuck it. I bought the thing. Let, let's break it apart and, and see what I can do with it. You know? And to this day, I, I actually really love how those come out when I have to refill those pens. It's such process because I have to sit here testing the, the consistency and like how it comes out on, on, on a test sheet mm-hmm. until I get like the flows that I really like. But to this day, I, I use that. I have three brush pens. I have one pitch black. I have one that's about 30% ink, 70% water. And the last one is about 10% ink and 90% water. And that's basically what I do 90% of my ink ink drawings with. It, it, it makes so much sense. And and you're telling me that's not how it's intended to be used. It's, it's pretty unbelievable. It might be. Honestly, I, I, what I'm saying is like, I didn't like Google it. Mm-hmm. I was just looking at this, uh, this water pen. And to me, it made sense in my head. Like, I have five of these things. I don't really need five. Right. Let's fucking let's figure this out, you know. And uh, it took a while, but and I clogged a couple of those pens up with all that, like, shitty ink. I, uh, that's another kind of learning issue mm-hmm. I had with that. I had to learn, like, hey, don't, you, don't buy bullshit cheap ink because it, it's going to solidify in the brush and you're never going to be able to use this thing again, mm-hmm. you know. Little things like that I learned along the way. Even like with how I work audio, I run like my, when I record vocals, I run it through um, an audio filter in Ableton that I am 100% sure 
is not intended for vocals. Right. But I sat here trying every filter, and I found that this particular filter that was preloaded into Ableton, it's called Bright Snare. So it's clearly intended for uh, percussion. Yeah. But I found some settings that made my audio sound so crisp and so clean that to this day, it's been about a year and a half, I still use that dummy, dumb, dumb fucking <laughs> preference for my audio. And, and it's another example of like me just making my materials work for me, you know? Right. Yeah, no, that's 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 exactly the answer I was hoping to hear, you know, like because it's it's being uh, ingenuitive, you yeah. know, it's it's working with what's in front of you and figuring out how to make the product. And if you've got this thing and it sounds good, I, I don't know. I think I have a problem with anyone who is a purist um, that like this is the way it's supposed to be because the person who designed the thing didn't see that it could be used another way. If that makes yeah. sense. It's like just because the inventor didn't see how you were going to put it to work uh, doesn't mean that you're wrong. Yeah, there's no right or wrong way to make or to be creative. You know, there's there's no such thing. Just uh, find something and, and make it work for you. Because, you know, if you search hard enough, you'll find how to do that. There's a formula. And my dad always told, uh, used to tell me that there's always a way. Right. It's just a matter of, like you said, just keep smashing into the wall until it breaks down, you know. <laughs> Sometimes it takes years, and a lot of people don't have my kind of patience for that. Uh, like I said, I'm a dummy. I don't know what I'm doing, um, but I make it work for me. I'm going to say the word dummy, but I don't think you're a dummy. And if I did, I wouldn't talk to you. But uh, that's that's not entirely true either. That sounds mean. Um, but no, I, I, I don't I don't think you're stupid. I think you're remarkably persistent, and I think that work shows. Uh, but the reason that I'm going to uh, highlight the fact that you said that is because there are so many people who get so down on themselves um, when they say like, ah, oh, I, I, I can't do that. I don't have that. I can't, you know, and they, they really kind of tear themselves up. And it seems like the key distinction between them and you is that you just did it anyway because it made you feel good. And I think people often get blocked out by uh, some sort of imaginary list of prerequisites to like be creative and they, they're not real. You know, Nipsey Hussle said this thing, and uh, there's two quotes that come to mind when you bring that topic up. Nipsey Hussle, rest in peace, mm -hmm. um, he said this thing where this radio host asked him, like, what was the difference between him and the other local rappers that didn't make it? And he just said straight up, to paraphrase, persistence, you know, I, I stuck with it. Uh, at the first sign of hardship, I didn't just give up and call it quits. I stuck to this craft, and here I am uh, at the top of it. So I really love that perspective. Um, and another thing is you, you can't be afraid to be bad at something. You know, Justin Roiland, who 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 was famous for co-creating Rick and Morty, uh, to really paraphrase what he was saying, he was asked at a panel um, some advice for new writers. And this is advice that I that I still follow very closely to this day. And and I don't apply it to writing. I apply it to visual arts. But the idea is to just fucking finish something. Just finish it. Look at what you did wrong and take that knowledge to uh, the next one of that thing you're doing, you know, finish a painting, finish a song, put it out there and examine it. Look at look at where you could have done better and do better next time, you know? Yeah, I, I if I can, uh, you know, just again, play with another analogy here. You know, it's it's like looking at a house that isn't done being built and complaining that the house isn't suitable. It's like a thousand percent. Yeah. You know, it's of course you can't live in it yet. It's not finished and you're not going to get right. any good at making one until you've made one and figured out, you know, how to do it. Right. So, right. I don't and know. Making houses sucks sometimes. Sometimes it's not fun. Sometimes it, you have to resort to that uh, discipline mentality where it's like, I'm not here just for the fun of it. I'm here to get better at this, you know? Right. It's appreciation for the actual process, the, the craft, yeah. and whatever, Trust and finding the process. So that said, you do seem to find a lot of like catharsis and process and actually making. Uh, how do you handle? Um, there, there is a, there is the part that comes after, um, and and I think you're very good at it. And I, I remember bumping to you at a at our friend Kim's uh, housewarming party and saying I admired it because you're very good at putting it out there. And um, engaging with a community, too, which is a, a big part of being creative. It's not just the part of making. It's the part of distributing. It's the part of uh, bringing attention to. I think you also have a 
you you're a wonderfully charming human being to begin with and you're also very good at like conveying that um in a digital medium where people don't see you face to face so i don't know was there any sort of learning curve with with that as well or is that another case of just keep trying stuff and see what works and engaging with an actual audience because i think that's a, a part that's overlooked a lot well first off I, I feel like i'm really bad at engaging with uh with with the internet and internet folk and that kind of that level of promotion um because i hate doing it yeah <laughs> i really hate if you notice like through this, throughout this whole quarantine i haven't been posting nothing no instagram stories no tweets i've just been you know that shit stresses me out honestly and there's so, enough there's um, enough going on man i mean oh my god there's so much going on everyone you know i, I don't want to hate on nobody i try i do really do my best to be positive but you know i know that nobody cares i'm not going to go down that road okay. I'm, i'll just say i think i'm really bad at it so it's interesting to hear someone say that i'm, I'm, I'm good at it um but one of my strengths to it i would say is uh same as everything else like i don't look at social the instagram and twitter and facebook for fun all the time sometimes i feel like that shit is a job you know sometimes it uh sometimes i know i should be posting about something and um fi and for me it's been finding a balance between like that duty because uh, that duty to put it out there because let's be honest uh no one creates art for themselves um and i think i think that's kind of a contentious statement because a lot of people would probably disagree with me. Like, oh, I, I create art purely for myself, which I think you're a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I think, A, you're a liar, and B, you're a weirdo. You know, I do this to share it, to build community. That's, that's the whole point of me doing this. I would be lying if I said that I'd be content in my own little world just creating art, as romantic as that sounds. you you got to be real at some point. So if you just create art for yourself, you're either the Buddha himself or you're a total weirdo. Um, but, you know, with that being said, if if you are willing to accept that an essential part of art is sharing and community and, and interconnectivity, then this is part of the process. Sharing it is part of the process. And, you know, if you're if you're alive in the 21st century, what's option number one when it comes to sharing online? engaging being being amongst the people doing shows getting a business card going with your digital information on it so they can follow up with you you know so i to to give the short form answer i look at it as part of the discipline the uh promotion part right in that realm also i did want to bring attention to the fact that i i went back and like before this whole interview i was I listened to your latest full-length Business Casual. Uh, I'm going to say it now. If you haven't heard Business Casual from Onodera, I told him off mic, and I'll say it to you right now, too. There's part of it that f made me physically weak. Uh, it was like, it's so moving. There's so, there's something on there, and I'm sure we'll talk more about it at the very end. But I'm going back, and I'm listening to things that uh, Renee's put out. And... Um, there's a track on uh, the album uh, Origami called Dolores. And you said the line, um, I wrote it down because I liked it so much. You said, I've learned what's good for art ain't always good for what's fiscal. And there's truth to that. But uh, that album came out like three years ago. And you've probably grown a lot since then. And that still holds true. But uh, have you found a way to um, uh, finance your operation or 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 to make this so that at least parts of this operation can sustain itself? Um, I think I've, everything's a balance, you know? Um, and maybe that was a short-sighted statement at that time because I, I had no appreciation for the balance, but, but looking at that statement now, I still think it's true, but, but I think I've gotten to know my balance a little bit. I've certainly uh, found ways to, to, you know, prosper off of this art. Which is also an essential part if you if you plan on doing this for the for your whole life, you know, um, between like monetizing tracks, people buying albums off of Bandcamp, uh, accepting commissions, selling stickers, selling shirts. There are things to like weave, um, weave gains into your output. You know, mm -hmm. there there's certainly and, and it's a balance between like you know, because I used to feel like anytime I tried to do it, it was so forced. It felt so forced and so fraudulent, but that's because I was trying to do it in ways that weren't 
in tune with like the Ono Dara brand. It wasn't in tune with like Renee as a human being. Um, being so so knee deep in this uh, in this world now, this art create creativity world, I think I have an understanding that um, just like everything else, I mean it's very cyclical. You know, everything comes back to the same point. Make that shit work for you. And I have an appreciation for there are ways I can make that idea of uh, winning. <laughs> scraping yeah. in the winds anything you can the pennies from your creations um and and there's a balance there for me and it's really just a matter of me um pursuing it so so yeah i, I stand by that statement but it's more nuanced my understanding of that statement now right i i, I do want to point out that like what you said just now about uh not being on brands and i think like certain people I don't know. I think some people think they've got a brand and they don't. I think some people are afraid of the word brand and don't want to go near it because it's disingenuous. I think there's a lot of different positions you can take once the word brand appears on the table. Uh, but mm -hmm. when I hear you say brand, I hear you say uh, I'm hearing sincerity. You know, it's you being you uh, and just putting yourself out there. And I think if I'm hearing you right, Maybe you've struggled with it in the past because you felt, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, um, but I'm trying to, mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to, to put it a certain way. It, it seems like in the past, maybe when you were doing it and you felt it was insincere, like maybe there's that part of you that thinks I'm just doing, this is a money play and that's not really what I'm about and versus now where it's like, this is just an extension of me. And this is, I don't know, stop me here and, and tell me where I'm wrong. Cause I don't know if I got that right. Um, no, I think, uh, I think you're more or less correct. Um, maybe not necessarily. It doesn't just have to be money. It could also just be social currency, you know, clout as, uh, as the young whippersnappers say, mm. uh, you know, and just doing a shit for clout. Like, it, it doesn't feel good at the end of the day, you know? Um, and, you know, I say brand, but, uh, and you're right. It is kind of a, a, a scary word to put out there as someone who, who, who considers themselves like this, this genuine creative, you know, whatever the fuck that means. Right. Um, right. this, this moralistic figure, you know, <laughs> it's for the birds, man. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, but, but in discovering what my brand is, I've realized like, I am Ono Dara. The brand is me. The brand is a direct extension of my humanity, my personage. And sometimes the, the simple answer, because you know me, everything's simple. I don't like looking at nothing in big words, nothing in some complex sort of framework. Everything is just, I, I try to keep my existence as dumb as possible because, you know, a dumb life is a happy life, right? Um, sure. And, you know, getting to know the brand was really, Ono Dara getting to know himself, me getting to know what I want out of this artwork, what I want out of this music, what I want out of this life. And, you know, I've never been more confident in that brand. I know who I am. I know what I want. I know what I do, what I'm good at. I, I know what I'm capable of. So, you know, I'm comfortable with that word now because I am the brand. It's me. I'm selling myself as the artist here. It's all connected because it all comes from one source. I'm the source. I'm the plug. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I mean, it, it, it seems like uh, that's the only way you could do anything effectively. I don't think people buy shit if they, uh, and, and again, buying, meaning uh, subscribing to something, yeah, yeah. if they think they're being played or if they think it's insincere. Um, and and right. I, I, I don't know. I, I think that's a big part of it. And, and developing this, my thoughts were like, well, maybe I could talk to artists and maybe I can like learn how they maybe like, you know, make a little bit of money. But I didn't, but I, the last thing I wanted was this to be some sort of like podcast to be like, how do you build your sales funnels to break like a 60 K a year on the side? Like, I didn't want any of that. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, when I do speak about these things, I am speaking about it from like the point of, um, okay, how, how does Ono Dara get his art out there? How does he, keep himself happy how does he keep his fans happy and how does he keep his whole enterprise um moving and uh and and create his world so that he can continue to build and make within it um 
what you said about just you being the source and the plug and trusting yourself. I think that's that's huge, too. And I think the big takeaway for somebody listening might be to just maybe stop looking to make a quick buck doing art and actually just ask yourself some big questions first about who you are. I mean, also, hey, hey make good art. <laughs> sure. Like, 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 I think a lot of people are, uh, get caught up in the attention before they get caught up in the quality. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I used to be really looking at the numbers and, and looking at like who was paying attention. And where I'm at right now, I, I don't give a fuck. The people who, like, the people who care about what I do, people message me some really heartfelt messages about about my music and and. People reach out to me with very sincere, uh, uh, sincere tones in how they speak to me, appreciating what I do, and and you know it's, I, I think that means more to me than like ten of those quote unquote fans that just like double tap and, and move on with their day, you know, um, that 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 sincerity speaks to people I think, and uh, you know. Like even on Spotify, uh, for for I would consider myself a local artist. I, I noticed that like I don't have the most plays, but I have like a lot of uh, a pretty high number compared to other local artists of monthly listeners, which which is to say like people who come back to the album that they heard or the song that they liked and play it again, right. you know, versus like another artist who who's really popular and maybe like when he first drops the song it gets like five thousand plays. But then you look at their their monthly listeners. It's like fifty people, sixty people. And I'm not hating on that. Everyone has their own process and their own their own um, like what they're shooting for, right? Right. But I I sincerely like I appreciate like that that like notable number of people who who boomerang back to to see what I'm up to, you know. And uh, that's worth a lot more to me now than 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 that big shiny number, you know. Yeah, I mean, obviously there's like, I mean, something about the statistics that matter. I mean, not to say that, uh, you know, they don't matter. I guess depending on what you're trying to achieve, they do. But it, I mean, I think you're absolutely right because I think, I think what's happening in your case is that you're building a real connection because your music is uh, in inc incredibly sincere. Uh, I, I said it, I touched on it for a second. The album that you put out, last uh business casual i gave it a listen when it came out and i and i liked it a lot and then right before i talked to you uh or i knew i was gonna talk to you i put on the album again there's uh this wonderful uh, collection of samples uh from I, I heard mr rogers in there and i and i thought i heard it in one track i thought i heard daniel tiger or something and i'm like okay that's i think i hear that but i don't know for sure and then by the end of the album you there was very clearly mr rogers um you know i heard some of his songs repurposed and um it it hit me right at the right in the in the feels man i i got it and i just i'm like oh oh man i'm about to get real sad and i'm and it's set to this like amazingly like kind of melancholy but chill beat and it's saying this really heartwarming message message i was uh I was all over the place when I heard that and um, I had to go back and play it a couple of times. I think there's something to that. I think um, as far as your craft goes, and I kind of want to dive into the specific of your uh, music and maybe taking a look at like what the stereotype and the expectation is for uh, hip hop music and how you've sort of turned it on its head. It's very real and emotional in a way that I, I don't think is seen often in in popular hip-hop music um would you speak to that at all um as far as it being like kind of uh, alternative you mean yes um yeah i mean it's uh it's really just a result of what i listened to i mean you saw me when i was first performing i was clearly like on, on more of a folk punk sort of tip you know mm -hmm. um you know, back then it was it was a lot of punk rock. It was a lot of uh, singer songwriter, and that's who I was emulating. Um, you know, but truth be told, I mean, I've been listening to hip hop my whole life, and uh, I just kind of followed my emotion. You know, I was really angry <laughs> yeah. as a kid, 
you know, I think most of us, like, you know, quote unquote punk rocker kids or whatever you want to call it, that sounds so corny here in our lab. But, you know, I think most of us were really angry when we were in, in our teenage years. And then as we get older, we kind of acclimate to real life. I just got less angry and I didn't want to be on that guitar screaming about stuff. But I also didn't know how to how to write songs on that particular instrument that weren't screamy and emotional and sad all the time, you know? That's interesting. So it kind of forced me to change. Um, and then, and, and that in and of itself, uh, when I first started rapping and shit, I think I, uh, I was just doing my best impression of my favorite rappers. I wasn't really rapping like Renee yet. Ono Dara was just a, an image reflection of, of, of all his inspirations, right? But then the more I did this Ono Dara shit, the more it became in tune with, with me and as far as I'm concerned, like, I'm not just a hip hopper, you know, uh, I love punk rock. I love alternative. I love Bjork, you know, mm -hmm. um, I love Fiona Apple. I love Frank Ocean. So it's like all these inspirations, the more comfortable I became with like expressing myself through hip hop, the more natural it felt to incorporate all my influences. You know, like I, I have Nick Lee, the, the homie from Moontooth. Um, which you're very familiar with. Obviously, you just talked to John. Yep. And he plays a killer solo on this uh, track. Playing Possum, yeah. Which is, for all intents and purposes, as far as I'm concerned, that's a that's a punk song. That's not a hip-hop song. But it's on a quote-unquote hip-hop album. You I'm know? glad you brought that one up because I remember I was I was getting into like kind of a, a rhythm of the album or a couple of tracks in, and that song comes on, and I had to like look up and be like, did we skip to a different album? Um, there is, there is something to that, uh, diversity and like that, you know, that, that is amazing. And I think people can learn from that. Cause I think people, uh, are, I think people sometimes are afraid that if they, uh, deviate too much from like, what is the rule of this genre that they're going to scare people away. And I, I think that right. there, I think the opposite is true. I think you get a smaller, but greater loyalty uh, yeah. from people because they they know you're not there to to play a game and sell them and convince them you're something that you're not you're you're being like this is who i am this is i'm all over the map and uh i'm glad you're here that's kind of what i get out of it yeah, i mean most people are all over the map you know no one is just this one thing you know and um you know everything comes back to these same concepts you know just running my whole personage into a brick wall until I find a way through it. And that's what rapping was for me. That's what producing was for me. You know, when I first started producing beats, if you ask me, they all start, kind of sounded the same. Um, but as I got to know myself in that realm, you know, I was more comfortable in taking samples from uh, Mr. Rogers, you know, God rest his soul. But, but one of my biggest inspirations, I, I've taken samples from, um, who's the homie with the Afro? Bob Ross. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. I caught uh, Alan you know, Watts I, on origami too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, taking inspiration from from him, from Patrice O'Neill uh, at the at the start of one of my tracks on Business Casual. Mm -hmm. um, I sam I sampled Yoshi's Island. I sampled <laughs> Earthbound on that album. I sampled uh, Hey Arnold. You know, Jim Lang, who did the music for Hey Arnold, mm -hmm. fucking amazing jazz musician. Absolutely, you know, really talented people that inspire me in a genuine way, and. Um, you know, like the more I did this, the more comfortable I got with being more, more eclectic with uh, who I'm blatantly being inspired by. You know, I'm not, I'm not running from that inspiration anymore. Where, whereas I, I think um, some people, me included, when I started making this music, it, it, it does kind of feel more safe to run from those weirdo inspirations, you know? Right. I think people sometimes are afraid to even admit that they're inspired. And I think what I admire about your music is that you're not really shying away from anything. Um, I think people are almost like, I have influences and I don't want you to realize that these are my influences because then you'll think I'm just copying. But what I like about your music is like, these are my influences, but they are so all over the map. They're getting thrown into the Onodera centrifuge. And by the end, it's something totally different that I don't think many people have ever uh, heard anything quite like it. And um, to kind of uh, try to put a bow on this, I, I do love that you have always done your own album art and um, you've always done all your own promotion. Like the whole thing is a handcrafted operation. And I think that's also a big part of why I have referred to you in conversation with other people as 
uh, uh, prolific. I think you just have this uh, really powerful hand and that when you, um, it, it's not like you're doing one part and you're outsourcing other parts and whatever. I feel like it all goes through you. It all comes out through you. And there's just a sincerity that I really love. Um, I like to ask people about what tools they use. Um, whether that be like, I rely on high end tools or I'm scrappy and I'm working with this and it's a rig and it works. Um, so is there any, any tools you'd recommend? Like, let's say somebody wants to kind of like try the Onodera approach. What tools do, do you use to make things work for you? And are you comfortable sharing them? Oh, sure. Um, well, for music, uh, a lot of people, people think I go to studios. I, I've only gone to studios like a handful of times. The, the rest of the times I've recorded everything on my laptop by myself with my own little, you know, my, my own little setup that's gotten more complex as the years go by, right? Um, and one thing I'll recommend for any home studio goers out there that are trying to get crisper audio, um, th there's this thing called a Chaotica Eyeball. Chaotica spelled with a, like chaos, but with a K. Mm. I'm sure you could, if you Google it, it'll correct it for you. But the, cha the Chaotica Eyeball is essentially like this little sound shield that's kind of a globe-like that goes right over your mic, and let me tell you, the mo and it costs a pretty penny. I think I paid like two fifty for mine, maybe more, with uh, you know, um, tax and shipping and delivery, or whatever. But what a what a worthwhile uh, investment that was. Um, and before that, I had a whole another sound shield that kind of wasn't doing the trick. But um, even with a shitty mic, like a not complex, not nothing to write home about mic. If you slip one of these eyeballs onto one of your mics and you get like maybe a suspension system from from Amazon for like fifteen bucks, you know whatever, mm. um, you can you'd be surprised how crisp your your audio comes out. Um, but besides that, uh, recommendations for gear: definitely get an audio interface, get a get a, a decent enough laptop. I'm, I'm a big supporter of Ableton. Uh, I'm not saying I'm not telling you to go legally download it, but you know, find, <laughs> no, find we, we don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not saying I I paid for mine, of course. Certainly, you yeah. Know, but, but find your way to that program and don't be so intimidated by it. Watch a quick anything you want to learn about audio. Find it on YouTube. Watch the video on 1.5 times speed. Figure it out. You know. Yeah. Um, That's an important uh, setting, by the way. That that speed setting on YouTube. You can just barrel through shit. You know what I do sometimes uh, when I listen to podcasts or, or whatever, when like well, as I'm falling asleep, because mm. I'm one of those YouTube sleepers, I, I need it on. Just give me something. Mm -hmm. I'll put it to a 0.75 speed. Slow so you that down. Slow down will kind of lull me into that. I like and that. I, yeah. I'm trying Chips that tonight. Day, baby. I'm... Absolutely, man. I recommend it. That's funny, man. Uh, I, I tend to listen to, uh, you know, uh, Todd Barry, the comedian. I love, oh, what a sleepy voice to begin with. Don't that... tell him that. Todd Barry on Spotify, <laughs> on Spotify. I, I swear I didn't post it cause I'm a creep, but, uh, I, I put his album on all the time when I can't sleep and the amount of times I can't sleep. It's, it's all over the, I, it's all the time. So when I got right. that Spotify, like best of 2019, Todd Barry, and like absurd number of plays. And I'm like, I think I just, <laughs> I think I just paid rent at his house i think for him um <laughs> well probably not let me tell you i could i could talk about spotify payouts but that's a whole another conversation it's crazy man so yeah i mean that that is a i mean i'll touch on that really quick just to make the point i mean i think people think you get on spotify and you're gonna make a ton of clams but i personally know people that have gotten like outrageous plays on spotify it doesn't really yeah. equate into a substantial amount of money really the 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 best way to support an artist would be to, to buy the album direct from them or uh, yeah, to support absolutely. them at a live show if, if possible a thousand percent buy a shirt don't rely on the, the spotify numbers if you're looking to support not to say don't stream them but you know um it's definitely not a reliable source of income unless you're drake you know yeah uh not gonna happen like that but, you know, I also saw you posting about Ron Funches, who, uh, mm, who yeah. man, one of, if, if he is my flavor of tea, man. I love that human being. And I was, uh, I'm always shocked when people are into what I'm into. So yeah. it was cool to see you post that picture with him. Yeah. Because you brought up Todd Barry, who's like another comedian who I love. Mm -hmm. um, so 
And I think we have, I think we share comedian taste. I, I, I definitely think so too. I mean, I'm all over the map with comedy. I really admire the art form and I would do it if I thought I was uh, remotely funny or could remember a script. Um, but I think uh, I got into comedy podcasts, which is how I kind of started to think like, oh, maybe I could do one one day, you know, if I can kind of listen enough. And uh, I listen to so much comedy, I'd be afraid to do it because I would know everything I'm wearing at this point. I think I've, you know, I, the number of hours I've clocked, I'd be afraid to do it because I think I've sort of become like a comedy scholar, not a performer anymore. Um I think I've I think I've absorbed too much, but uh, yeah, Ron Funches was uh, fantastic. He was at Governors and uh, on uh, in Levittown, Long Island here, and uh, that was a weird venue to see him at because Long Island comedians do not fit that bill. And Ron Funches is this like <laughs> adorable man. He is like a bag of contradictions, and I think that's what I like about him. And I think that there is a parallel to tie this up nicely. I think there are elements of that description like a bag of contradictions and i think that kind of hits you on the head too i think you're kind of all over the map and you don't fit a mold you you make molds and um that's what i respect about you i like that thank you what a what a, what a high compliment <laughs> I, I mean it sincerely man um I, i've been super excited to talk to you about art stuff and uh i, I don't know i guess at this point is there anything else you got to add and anything you want to share with people um nothing really pressing uh, you know, I'm working one painting at a time. I'm kind of accidentally falling into a series. I've been, I've, I've been saving like a lot of screenshots of uh, movie scenes that I think are particularly beautiful. And uh, just one by one, I'm just painting movie scenes. So maybe I'll bust out like six or seven of those. So keep an eye on the, the Instagram for that, which I'm sure you'll tag somewhere. But uh, at Onodera Rene, O-N-O-D-E-R-A-R-E-N-E. And that's for everything. That's the Twitter. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Spotify, all that. Onoderene.com. I'm, I'm pretty easy, pretty easily found. I'm working on new music, but, you know, uh, under promise, over deliver. So who knows when it'll come out. But, you know, the quarantine has been good to me, sonically. So I'm really confident in the new shit. But by all means, and not that it's old shit. It just came out, what, December? Yeah. Um, so definitely go check out Business Casual. I, I produced all the tracks on there. I mixed it all myself. I recorded all my own vocals. I got some very talented homies backing me up. And it's a, it's a really heartfelt uh, piece of work, that particular project, very close to my soul. Um, and I, I still love it, you know. I, I tend to hate shit, like, the day after I release it and make it. But that project is a really... A, a, a special place in my heart i'm glad that yeah. album has escaped the uh the curse like the day old curse i get that uh yeah, yeah and yeah. and as and coming from a dude who makes album art professionally uh one of my favorite album covers i've seen in a very long time like i really love that album cover and it's like i i know you and i know how like again not to this word has no negative connotations you're scrappy. Like you make things work with what you got. And um, I know you took that picture at home, uh, probably in front of a white wall and then just drew on top of it. And like, it's just so it's like, it's, it's great. You're, you're the, the way you work um, and your process may seem almost uh, like, you, like somebody at a big studio is like, Oh, I can't believe you didn't use the high end red camera with the, you know, whatever lens. And uh, I don't know for my money, like again, your sincerity and your ethic, it comes right through. Like, I know that came from your hands and I know that it's the real deal. Well, you know, tr tr truth be told. I mean, I actually, uh, I, I spent some money on that with uh, some makeup effects and I got a professional portrait done um, from, from one of my homies, but like, it's still very much in line with what you say. Like I knew what I wanted as that album cover for a long time. And it's just like everything else I do, you know, eventually I caved in, I bought this $300 little soundproof eyeball to put my mic in, you know, this, this trickle in of, of quality, you know, I, I, I recently bought a, a huge ass art desk to, to make these paintings on. And I invested in a really flexible, wonderfully, endlessly useful light so I can properly paint, uh, you know, without having to adjust to, to fit the shadows of the, the light bulb on the ceiling, you know. Um, but I, I, I had a vision for that cover. And uh, the same thing, same with everything. I got, I got to know my brand. And I'm like, what is more me than anything? It's, uh, it's getting fucked up all through life, but, you know, smiling through it. And then throwing some doodles on there to really make it personal. 
Um, and yeah. I am going to make that album cover the uh, image for the episode. I'll probably put the death before desk job, like filter colors on it and stuff, but, uh, <laughs> but I'll, but I'll, that'll be the picture. So everybody can see uh, what we're talking about and uh, please Wonderful. go check out the album and all the wonderful artwork this man does at onoderabrene.com and on instagram at onoderabrene uh dude thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me i'm like i'm thrilled that we got to have this conversation yeah it was a good one man thank you for having me it was a fun conversation of course man i'll I'll talk to you later all right have a good night you too bro catch you later all right later for coming on please everybody go check out onodera renee o-n-o-d-e-r-a-r-e-n-e.com that's also onodera renee on instagram and twitter as well um just a quick follow-up from the intro which was recorded earlier in the week those loans i talked about the ppp loans funding has dried up for those loans but if you want to keep abreast with all the new information please Go to freelancersunion.org, sign up for their mailing list, follow them on social at freelancersu, and they will keep posting information related to COVID-19 support for artists. Um, If you have anything to add, to tell me, to share with me, you can email me, deathbeforedeskjob at gmail.com, or you can now check out the new website, deathbeforedeskjob.net. You can give to a Patreon. There's a store coming. You can contact me through there, listen to every episode, all three of them. I'll, I'll keep posting there, so uh, bookmark that. That's all I've got. Have a good week, everybody. Favorite